What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to Fudge Muppet. My name is Scott, here with Michael and Drew, as always, and today we are talking all about the Daedric Prince of Plots, Boethia. So, Drew, I know you, I know you love Boethia. <laughs> um, and we could probably get the, the scat story out of the way, you know? That's one of the most oh, important God. stories. Yeah, so. look, <laughs> sometimes you've got to build up, you've got to let it digest a bit before you get onto that, but I don't know. I mean, to, to start off with Boethia, like, we're all gamers here. So to put it in a way that all gamers can understand, Boeth is like the Dark Souls of Daedric Princes. You know, he's yeah. like, he's all about overcoming obstacles, being the best you can be. And if you want to be Boethia's champion, you've got to like kill everyone around and, you know, don't bootlick. You've got to prove yourself. That's Boethia. Yeah, mm. o- overcoming is a massive element. And that's, I guess, why she's very, she slash he is um, very favorable of Lorcan and the seems very like related like in some texts it's kind of like could be like implied lovers in others it could just sort of be like buddies and so on but as we know like Lorcan's sort of creation of Mundus um, is sort of a big mortal test Mm. in in the eyes of the Dunmer at least. I I guess I'll just quickly get out of the way as well that Boethia is one of those Daedric princes that just appears as a male and then a female and then as a male again even though they can all do that if they wanted to Boethia tends to do it a lot so you will hear in this podcast us switch between he and she. Not on purpose, just the- because... Like, I'm thinking of the Skyrim quest and I say she mm. or so on and so purely, forth. Um, purely just opinion-based, but I kind of liked when it was... Because the female introduction um, was in, um, in Skyrim. Before that, I'm pretty sure it was always male. And you had when it was like the anticipations and um the tribunal they were all like sort of reflections like vivek and um afala were both sort of um you know in the middle of the of the binary or whatever and then you had um almalexia's anticipation was boethia the the male female swap and azura sothasil and it was just kind of like neatly like that but, but, but then didn't, they went didn't and the texts often say that though predating skyrim maybe i'm wrong i, th- I feel like i just remember it being in the law could be but there are a lot of texts where they use both pronouns in the same text yeah, as well. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it is kind of cool. Well, that, I think Boethia is one of the ones who is coolest when they're embracing both, like depending mm-hmm. on the scheme or plot that's happening, and you know how it, it's it's kind of like Mafala. It can be beneficial to appear as people want to see you, whether that be female or male. Yeah, or whatever well, else. that's the thing. It's like any Daedric prince can technically do it. It's just you don't see it with some. Mm. Like there's nothing limiting Azura from showing up as a dude, you know. Yeah. yeah, that just sounds I mean, that, a bit odd, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Holding like a moon and a sun and just like, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to get too metaphysical too early, but it, it's interesting when you're talking about the connection with Lorcan. Like there's a, there's a lot of relationship between Boethia and Lorcan. There's even like um, the Khajiit call, the um, ebony mail, the sh- the death shroud of Lorcan. Mm, um, yeah. um, but what's interesting is when you kind of look at Boethia's teachings to the Kaima, there are a lot of similarities with the Elven Oriel, you know, the idea of escaping or transcending mortality in the mortal realm. Um, and I know, obviously, Lorcan's test, the the Sigic Endeavor, is kind of like that too. But it's weird how it does overlap with mm. the way the Elves see Oriel. Is it is about proving yourself beyond mortality. I guess the difference is maybe Boethia didn't really like the idea that Elves were just looking backwards and feeling sorry for themselves. Instead, they're supposed to embrace their challenge yeah well that's the fundamental sort of um difference which you know we'll, we'll get to the to the poo story everyone wants but we've <laughs> got um where you know boethia has sort of uh given her teachings to the velothi and prophet veloth so the velothi are veloth's followers and they were leaving to go to a new land which was resdane later morrowind um, and they became the kaima people but on the way trinamac um Oriel's champion tried to stop um, tried to stop them and then so uh boethia uh well there's different way there's different texts to say how it goes down like some say like boethia just won some say mafala came and stabbed trinamac and weakened him because trinamac's supposed to be like one of the most powerful gods um ever but the big sort of uh this is it there, this is the story I was, yeah we're gonna get to the poo story but here it is <laughs> but um boethia um was uh didn't like the way that what, what was it again that there's a quote it's like uh they didn't like a tri- they thought that tears weren't the right response to the sundering or something it's right, something yes. like that i can't i'm paraphrasing hardcore there but essentially um they thought 
uh, Boethia thought Trinimac was, you know, taking Lorcan's name in vain and, you know, obviously a big fan of Lorcan. And then, um, yeah, and, and then they had a little fight. And the traditional, well, one of the traditional stories is that um, Boethia ate Trinimac and essentially shat him out and he turned into Trinimac, uh, into Malakath. And mm. now that's why. And that's, or there's an alternative version where it was like sort of like excrement sort of shout out and then they rubbed it all over themselves or like the I've heard that on it? both Their followers yeah, like the yeah. followers of Trinamac did that and became the orcs but also the dark um, well the old did that and became like the, the Kaima yeah um, they, they, there's, uh... <laughs> it, it can get quite weird I mean everyone's got their own version of the story Malakath himself himself says that that's like far too literal but I mean I would say that too <laughs> if, if mm. I was in that position because I'd be embarrassed it's one of the, actually, the whole thing, that little story there, it's a really good way to think of it. I think it's like the perfect example of sort of an, what they call an Anuic or a Padmaic sort of philosophy. Like it just puts them right there. But with here is completely a Padmaic idea, all for Lorcan, all for the, the challenge overcoming kind of thing. And then you've kind of got um, the Anuic perspective being the looking upon creation unfavorably and being like, we're trapped or whatever. So, you know, for example, like Red Guards, even though they're not, connected to the elven pantheon they do share the same anuic beliefs about how you know mortality is kind of a bad thing it is fun yeah. so, sorry i was gonna say it is funny how they go to morrowind and the dwemer obviously have a presence there and while the two elvis elvish races go about it completely different ways they are both trying to ascend to godhood in a way like the dwemer through technology and kind of you know all of their uh tonal architecture and whatnot but then the kaima in the sense of just transcendence through overcoming life's obstacles and leveling up as drew likes to put it to all the gamers out there <laughs> but but but, but um, it is it is like that as opposed to like praying and just hoping to go back one day to your ancestor form or or undoing the yeah, world or whatever way you want to go about it it's like transcendence through like action at, at the end of the day boethia's goal with this dealing with trinamac was was purely to prove that, you know, Trinomach is called the Paragon. He's like the perfect example of what you should aspire to be. Whereas Boethia is saying, no, don't like, you know, don't just kneel and worship gods and do nothing for yourself. Prove yourself to be a god. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, if Malakath is saying it's too literal minded, you could almost imagine it like the saying we have. We're like, oh, get shit on, bro. <laughs> like, you know, you're having an argument and he, he beats down Trinomach's ideas. And mm -hmm. that's essentially him like, you know, pooing him out <laughs> it's just like beating him in the uh in the field of ideas but There's at the a... same time it's merefic era so you never know it could be literal mm, i mean the the book boethia's proving which you can find in skyrim is, is a good example of boethia's attitude because it's mm. the one that talks about the followings going to summon the followers going to summon boethia and then as they appear they're kind of all even though they're boethia followers you'd think they'd know how to act but they're kind of uh, a bit too begging for mercy and she basically destroys each one even with like a blink or breath and things like that until one of them realizes well oh i better do something and just basically shanks the other one <laughs> in front mm. of her and um kills the other follower and then they get rewarded and i think it's through is it in her teeth that the gate of oblivion opens up and they go through into her realm in um is this the oblivion one in that story it's from skyrim it's right from but yeah skyrim. i know the exact story you're talking about it's something poetic yeah like, that. Uh, like she, you know yeah, into yeah. her mouth or her jaws or something yeah like that. so it's have mercy upon us one of them says she blinked twice once he was in agony twice he was destroyed she cast a withering glance across those remaining and said i do not grant mercy and so it was with the others she putting them to proof they offering none Finally, she came to me, eyes aglow with anger, tongue wet with hate, and said, Of all my believers but two remain, tell me, second to last, with what shall you prove your existence? Without hesitation, I drew forth my blade and buried it in the chest of the other who stood beside me, and without fear replied, Ask him whose blood now sprouts from my blade if I exist. She smiled, and the gates of oblivion opened between her teeth. Then she said, Tell me, now last of my followers, wherefore do you remain where the others do not? I retrieved my blade and offered it up, saying, I am alive because that one is dead. I exist because I have the will to do so, and I shall remain as long as there are signs of my handwork, such as the blood dripping from this blade. Accepting my gift, she nodded and said, Indeed. 
Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Well, again, yes. and uh, another thing is ESO, uh, I think, makes it canon that essentially her um, her arch rival is Molag Bal. And I was, I was thinking about that a bit. And it kind of makes sense that out of all the Daedric princes for Boethia to hate, it would be Molag Bal. Because even though he's strong, there's two things really he does for mortals. Either one, he enslaves them and takes away all their free will and their ability to to achieve the Sigic Endeavor or, or whatever. Um, or he's giving them like this kind of artificial immortality in the form of vampirism where you don't actually, if you're a vampire and you can live eternally, you don't really need to strive to kind of like, yeah. you know, defeat the tower and overcome mortality. It's just, you know, it's cheap. Kind of like Boethia just chooses violence every day. Like that's her. <laughs> Woke up that's, and chose violence. Yeah, like that's <laughs> a, there's a really, there's a good chunk here that I think sums her up pretty well called Glorious Upheaval. It's from Elder Scrolls Online. But it's basically like a, a book trying to convince you away from the eight divines and why you should follow Boethia. But Boethia waits to receive the wordy word. Boethia waits to receive the worthy. <laughs> he pays no ne- no heed to mewling praise and prayers or cries for aid and mercy from his faithful. He delights in the blood of the overthrown, the betrayed, the conquered and murdered, those too weak to survive and receive his gifts. Only rebellion and violence, only treachery and aggression, and the power you seize can prove you a mere speck of dusk dust was deserving of notice your prize waits between his dripping fangs if you dare claim it the tested who stand drenched by the viscera of the pitiful glimpse secrets held only by the prince of plots which i'm sure is sort of like you know sigic endeavor kind of related um who proved the weakness of gods when trinomac suffered in his stomach every power can be dismantled demonstrate your will to the deceiver do what you must to sever the grip of all rulers and place the crown on your own brow in this way you carve the path to illumination you recognize your potential and like i really like that too because it kind of it sounds so much like kim like and especially if you look at the 36 lessons of avec and all of the um references to um you know the the ruling king and the crowns and like you know using sort of uh monarchy what, what's it what's it called again um uh, but Malak Bell calls it the uh, the symbol of royalty is Kim. That's the, like that's how it's right. called. So um, you know, and that, that Kim is quite literally exerting your utmost will onto the universe and so on. And it's very in like that sort of Boethius domain of overcoming and, and ex- exertion and you know becoming a god. Even it, like it's very suited for that long term mm, kind of goal. It is interesting that out of the three good Daedra that the Dark Elves follow they're quite different, like, especially in terms of how they want to be worshipped. Like, Azura basically wants you to <coughs> suck up to her, basically what you absolutely shouldn't do when talking to a summoned Boethia, mm-hmm. um, whereas Boethia is definitely more, uh, I guess, anti-simp in the way. Like, he- here's a quote from Boethia's proving again, but, like, here's what one of them said to her and got killed. Each night I pray to thee, each night I call out thy wondrous names. Surely thou must recognize the sound of my voice, thy most devoted of believers. She frowned and let out a long sigh, and then of... Okay, their typo, I guess. And then of a sudden he was gone, the air from her lungs dispersing him. So, you know, it's kind of like... It'd be good to get Boethia's take on... The tribunal, well, the tribunal betraying um, Nerevar and tapping the heart of Lorcan, because really everything about that process kind of aligns with what Boethia is teaching them. If you sort of read, like, if, when you read the thirty-six lessons of Vivek and look at what Vivek did, it's very in alignment with what Boethia would teach, mm-hmm. and that's why sometimes it's kind of like the, um, it's a cruel, like the good Daedra aren't, you know. It's their metaphysical kind of lessons, or there's more. Like if you just look at them, like the three together, there's no, there's a lot of like nuance is the reason to why they are worshipped by the Dunmer or so on. Because at a face value look, like from a Cyrodiilic perspective, there a lot of them, you know, Mephila and Boethia especially, look pretty horrible. You know, so it's the kind of, um, mm. yeah. And I mean, at the same time, you know, after I said. Um, Tapping the heart of Lorcan would kind of potentially suit Boethia. Um, I can't remember what source it's from. I think it's from ESO as well. But oh, actually, no, no, it's not. It's not. It's um. But there's a quote. That's, it's from the Five Songs of Wolfarth. It says yeah. Nerevar is the son of Boethia, uh, one of the strongest Padamaics. Which I don't know. When I think of Nerevar, it's it's kind of it's 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 almost restoring order a lot of the time. You know, like in his life, Indril Nerevar was very much in charge, and he was kind of like looking after the. 
uh, looking after his people and keeping them alive and whatnot. And when he returns, it's to kind of undo the the Padamike, uh, the the Padamike forces that are being unleashed from the heart of Lorcan. It, it's interesting that because it's I kind of think sometimes, especially where you look at that, where um like you know there's the Sothasil Azura dynamic and the Boethia Amalexia. Like, it, there might be a bit of, like, more opposition within the reclamations or, or, or the anticipations than you think. But what's strange about that is that reference of, like, the son of Boethia. Because outside of that, um, Nerevar is, like, most associated as Azura's champion. And and mm. Azura is the one who was, like, personally the most slighted by the tribunal's actions. You know, she set forth the prophecy and everything to bring it back down. And it's funny that it's, like, I guess these songs of Izmir are from, like, a... Um, Nordic perspective on the whole thing, mm. or like calling them son of Boethia. So maybe it's a less nuanced take or something on it. But it's interesting that like they that acknowledge him as a Padamaic, but I don't know, like Nords are technically Padamaic. You know, they, they fall onto that yeah. sort of thing. They're very favorable of creation and stuff. So it's kind of, but then again, you know, divides. I, I guess like, I guess one thing you could say about the Anuic Padamaic um, dynamic is that Padmeic, who look favorably upon creation, um, and like you know Lorcan's test and everything, they aren't necessarily going to um, like align together. Like they might, it's they don't have any like sort of joint interest because the Padmeic sort of or Sigic endeavor ideal is to overcome and and mm. violent and combative, you know, reach heaven by violence kind of thing. It's also Whereas, a chaotic force anyway. Like yeah, you can imagine it's not cohesive. Mm. Whereas the Anuic, it's sort of like everyone can just sit there and cry and have a big group hug and be <laughs> like, oh, creation's so bad. I wish we were like floating mm. spirits in Aetherius. Yeah. Like they can all kind of align around their beliefs more because, yeah. I mean, like I just... you could you could look at it just like Earth in the sense that like I'm, at least a lot of people on Earth are favorable towards creation. I mean, but we wouldn't sit around saying we're all... Padamaic and all get along and all have the same beliefs like there's going to be a huge diversity in all mm. the different cultures that fall within that that sphere or, or classification yeah yeah um one other cool quote here this is just a cool quote might not be relevant but let's see if you want to explore it but it was basically it's talk it's the same thing talking about um the why you shouldn't re uh Follow the divines. Reject the eyeless Adra rotting in Aetherius, that prison realm where flaccid souls languish, useless and drained. Deny their commands and revel in combat. Speak heresies as black as the void and laugh in the face of the dragon ghost Akatosh and his crumbling kin. <laughs> I just thought it was mad. It sounds really cool. <laughs> it's like some Boethia propaganda until she kills one of your best friends in front of you and you go, oh no. Yeah. Because it's tough love, right? But then mm. it's, it's not... In the sense that she tends to uh, make an example out of someone so severely that they die. It's kind of like you have one chance. Yeah. I, I feel like I can't really articulate it well now. But I know that um, in the 36 Lessons of Vivek and it right into Boethia's sphere with Lorcan and everything. That the, con the, the concept of like will... Um, and love being sort of the same thing. Uh, like, basically, there's a... I can't articulate it here. It's quite, like, complex, and I need the quotes and stuff, and maybe I'll have a go at it later. But um, there's this idea of, like, especially the way that Vivek talks about it, that will being, like, a form of, like, love, it, it, or love under will. I, I forgot I forgot the exact thing, but basically that will in general is a, is a powerful theme in the Elder Scrolls. Like, you can forget about the love part for a bit, but will really is like the overcomer like all the stuff with kim and um and also will as in like asserting your myth like if we talk mm. about how like myth is a bit more like give and take and if we, you get on the dragon break all that crazy stuff and calpers and whatnot but if we talk about the idea like a myth appear where you're sort of you know changing the myth is somewhat changing reality that is a will being exerted on things but yeah. Well, as a way to try and kind of reconcile that with the topic, it's like where you know when you look at it through Boethia's eyes of um, the Anuic forces like Aetherius and the Divine. So, say for example, Akatosh is being driven insane by the the sheer undertaking of maintaining time, and then Aetherius is where Magnus, despite being this this brilliant god of magic who's created the sun, fled. He ran away from this this kind of daunting prospect of creating the mortal realm whereas you've got meridia who um what's the term consorted with illicit spectra yeah. which is referring to lorcan so meridia despite excuse me all her kin running away potentially fell in love with lorcan 
and as a result she got to create her own realm of her she got to create her colored rooms and she gets to be a part of the mortal realm and she's it's very dynamic and you could say like as you said with will equals love her willing herself to defy her siblings and her father and and embrace what Lorcan's creating is kind of what Boethia is talking about kind the of, idea of the yeah like through it, love they're kind of like willing themselves into into being and being a part of everything as opposed to just running away and hiding yeah, the I mean you could, even, you could think about too like things like you know creating a baby is like you're like you sort of need to <laughs> love to exert <laughs> will. your will on the universe <laughs> but it is the kind of idea that like you know will is often connected to love so for example you know, you're really ambitious and you want to do really well in your life and became, say, maybe you want to be some famous author or something. The, the love there is kind of blended with the will and it's what gives you the will to do it. Like, if you don't love life, you lose the will to live. Do you know what I mean? They somewhat it kind of, it, it kind of seems like passion would be like a good way to fuse those two ideas together. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, but, yeah, because um, like, you know, as another example, if you don't have passion when you're, say, like, creating something, you know, like a, I don't know, like a Fallout 76 or something, <laughs> it, you, you just make something, you just make something crappy. If you, if you don't love, if you're not in love with the process and you're kind of just doing it for some other reason, like a ching or something like that, that, you know, that's just a random example. But, you know, that's what, so Boethia would never have allowed it to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I've I've talked us into a corner. I think. <laughs> yeah. We've got to dig our way back out now. Well, a um a good way is I feel like we've covered a lot of. We, you kind of get the gist of what Boethia is in the sort of conventional understanding. Um, you know, will overcoming all that kind of stuff. But by any means necessary, wake up, choose violence, all that. But we can talk about some of the other um, uh, interpretations of Boethia. I really like Boethra from the um. Mm from the else elsewhere's pantheon so called the warrior of east and west which is also interesting i don't know if that's a direct reference to like east as in morrowind and west as in like maybe elsewhere where they are i guess or but mm. i don't know i'm not actually i can't remember i can't remember if there is an in mythos thing for that mm. but um I, I i like that take it's another another sort of thing with the law i'm trying to I'll find again. Yeah, so Boethra, the warrior of east of the east and west, she is the mate of Mafala, who did not forget her love for Boethra after Anur sent her into exile for her rebellious nature. Boethra walked the many paths in exile and she returned. It was she who pried the eye from Magrus, and this is why Khajiit values swords as well as claws. There is no need for a true cat to pray to Boethra, as you honor this spirit merely by walking the path and only hiding in order to pounce. Mm. It is forbidden to say her name on the nights of the ghost moon, as during these phases, Boethra dons the Death Shroud of Lorcage and wages war beyond the lattice. And the Death Shroud being there is the Ebony Mail, which is really cool because we made videos before about how like Ebony is like the um, crystallized blood of Lorcan. That's why you find a lot of it in Morrowind around from the, where the heart was. Um, but sort of yeah. wearing, yeah, it's such an epic name, well, Death Shroud, by comparison. Yeah. Well, with the, <laughs> like, with the Khajiit um, mythos kind of coming into it, it really does... Um, amplify just how much Boethia is in in the nature of her sphere means that she's constantly in conflict with other other deities and you know you've obviously got the the conflict with Trinomac that we all know but then just in the few sources we have from the Khajiit stories she fights Molag Bal, Meridia and Merun's Dagon when they assault the Lunar Lattice she pried out Magris's eye as you said she fought Noctra to to reassure her that she wasn't the great darkness namira but she was something of her own so because of boethia's sphere she is always involved you know that she becomes one of the most um dynamic of all the princes purely because of that it is it is interesting as well how it carries over into the kajidi ideology so heavily that they don't even worship boethia in the traditional sense like, if we go back to that story about the reverence and Boethia not really liking it, in their pantheon, it's like, no, we don't even pray to her at all. We just take the action. Yeah. Like, we mm. just be what the ideology is and live it and not talk about it and pray about it and whatever else. I, I really like that. I think that's really cool. And I like how the... Which we haven't really talked about heaps yet, 
the whole traitorous betrayal element of Boethia, because obviously Boethia is not just a soul warrior god in the sense that you could say Trinamac or some some deity like that is. So, um, yeah, I, I just really yeah. like that. It's like waiting in order to pounce. Mm. That's what I was getting to. It's kind of like, uh, to like further talk about Boethia in general, um, it's anything to achieve your goal. It's just like, and nothing's off limits. It's all about your will to win, whether it's underhanded or whether it's, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. It's just about becoming, I guess, the most powerful you can be, even or using everything you can. So that's why it's interesting that, like, just to connect back in, like Nerevar being the son of Boethia, it's just interesting that that's the take on it or that name, just because um, what the tribunal did sounds very in... Um, you know, very within Boethia's sphere of things, you know, mm. like you know, stealing power and overcoming. So it really and seems like an Azura thing to be no annoyed about, which is... But, but then again, sometimes the Daedra, they obviously have their own motives and we have to see them in some ways still as individuals. In the same way that Nocturnal mm. wanted to pry power in Elder Scrolls Online and a lot of people were angry because they're like, no, she's just this shadowy god of thieves who only mm. does nice things. But in the same way, it's like you can betray someone and and they can be like oh that's cool cuz i like betrayal and that's my technique but um i'm i'm still mad at you because you betrayed me mm. do, do, yeah. do, you, do you get yeah. what i'm getting at mm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah but yeah it's it's also weird about nerevar because you know even if you look at it through the khajiit perspective you've got mafala and boethra being mates so the and and if you know if Bo, if Nerevar is the son of Boethia, then Azura is the only one potentially not involved in the creation of Nerevar. Yet, you know, um, the the tie between Azura and Nerevar is so strong. It's but yeah, sorry. Oh no, go on. I was going to change the subject. Oh, totally, I was just so saying that it's <laughs> like it's stated that they um that they're all allies. The so you have Azura, Boethra, and um, Mafala are allies as well as like with Lorcage was like they, it's more sort of explicit in the Khajiit mythology the Khajiit mythology has heaps of overlap with them with um Dunma mm. um mythology it's such a cool mythology as well it's a, mm. it's such a shame that they kind of riddle Tharet out of the current state of things like it's like everything yeah. cool is old and and not modern it's like oh they, they had this really cool pantheon that was more popular back in the day mm. but not so much anymore I'd love to see it return I mean, this statue looks really cool. The one in the Elder Scrolls Online for Boethra. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you, you almost can't really tell that that's a Khajiit until you see the tail. Because there's like a, a lynx looking creature as well, which I, I like as kind of like a companion there. Reminds me a bit of a Clavicus file and Barbus dynamic. But you can see the tail of the, the creature. But then there's also a tail just tucked down, I, I believe, um, mm. where the cape, the cape of Boethra yeah. is. Um, they say it could be... a. Uh, Omer's rut, yeah. Khajiit, well, yeah. the ones that kind of look like human-y elf things. I'm also going to go ahead and assume that um, the katana is supposed to be gold brand, which is mm. one of Boethia's uh, Bowie other artifacts. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, um, one thing about Boethia as well, tied to a different race altogether, which I'll, I'll say now, this is completely conjecture, and it's like, you know, don't take this too seriously, anyone, but... It's kind of interesting when you look at the Falmor and the Old Mary Dominion in the fourth era. I, I I can almost imagine that once the Falmor took over, they were they were really radical compared to the kind of contemporaries and the the long line, lineages of um, of monarchs. And I can almost imagine that they've looked at their Anuic ideals of trying to kind of keep their purity and return to the divine, and like this isn't working. And I can imagine that they've kind of like secretly looked at what the Chimera have done and been like, but we has got some good points. So this is why we're going to, you know, obviously yeah. the Towers theory isn't proved, but maybe they want to go tear down the Towers I following what Boethia would tell them to do. I feel like right now you're unintentionally massaging Elder Scrolls Legends lore into it because remember in the Elder Scrolls Legends thing you have Lord Narafin and he has this plot with Boethia to mm. do the culling and you know this big Daedric ritual to kill off a bunch of people. So if you look at it through that view then perhaps that makes a little bit more sense as to I how some of the I, I, I was had thinking of thought about that connection. Yeah, yeah cuz I, I remember we were kind of like it, it is a little bit jarring to see the uh, the high elves, especially in the fourth era, when you, you imagine them being very, you know, in favor of the Aedra, then turning to Daedra, it seemed like an easy way to make him a bad guy. 
But yeah. if you do look at it through this kind of weird mm. conspiracy theory, then... I mean, there, you, there is the quote. Well, what about... Here, I'll add to your theory. Isn't there a quote in Oblivion that NPCs say to each other when they're just like, I hear Daedra worship is becoming increasingly popular in the Somerset <laughs> Isles. <laughs> isn't that... Mm. Isn't, isn't that... Okay. I can't remember. I'll take your word for it. I was, but, I was yeah. when I was playing Oblivion for video I'm working on. I, I'm pretty sure they said it. They wouldn't say Adra. Why would they say Adra worships becoming increasingly yeah. pop? They wouldn't say that. But you know, and, and the same thing. Like everyone's individuals, so you can have uh, like Narifin maybe takes on that ideology, like you were just talking about, Drew, and then he and his small cult, you know, act. You know, not necessarily in conjunction with the rest of the Thalmor, like they're doing their own thing to... Yeah, here's, here's, yeah. here's the quote. Um, I hear Daedra worship has become increasingly prevalent in the Somerset Isle. And then the two responses to that can be... Um, oh no, it's one. The Altma have powerful wizards. It could be a dangerous situation. Hmm. So, maybe the, a little foreshadowing there, potentially. <laughs> maybe the Thalmor are going to... The, the Chimera are going to come back because Boethi is going to change the Falmor into the Chimera. And then we're gonna have <laughs> it's like evolution. Come back. <laughs> <laughs> they just go further down the path and then they all end up Dark Elves and then Scott's <laughs> incredibly happy because Dark Elves occupy big spaces on both sides of the map. No, I kind I kind of like the Donma where they're at to be honest <laughs> at the moment. Like because I mean it even fits in. I, I like how it's neatly is sort of there. With the, with the downfall of the tribunal, they lose the sort of opulence that they had and the position of power that wasn't about the individuals. It was just given to them by these tribunal gods that basically protected them. And so now they've really embraced that sort of reclamations um, philosophy and the whole Sijic endeavor, which is to sort of like suffer and overcome. And in part, like Boethia, it's like earned, like fight your enemies and earn your way up. You know, versus when you when you see like the the golden age of the Dunmer, a lot of them are just, you know, chilling as rich priests and and you know, living in luxury. And it's kind of the opposite of the Sijic endeavor. So where Vivek succeeded, like that's what I talked about in that big Vivek video, is where he was sort of like where he kind of accomplished it, he kind of screwed over his people at the same time because he took away the challenge from them or the, the ability for mm. them to grow. So it was just on Vivek. But yeah, you can check that video out if you like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because they, they, they do need Boethia more than ever now if they're to come back from their current predicament because, mm. you know, as far as we know, the Argonians are still running rampant in the in south and central Morrowind. But then again, maybe Vivek could have just summoned a tidal wave and wash them all back to black marsh and then they'd be set without boethia's help it's i'm i'm interested the more i think about it and we probably should do an episode kind of just on the reclamations for this but um azura just seems like the the odd one out of mm. the bunch like there's obviously in terms of her philosophy like i don't really see perhaps actually maybe in the elsewhere mythology there's a bit more um but azura's connection to lorcan necessarily outside of you know being a daedra or whatever but her yeah, with the Khajiit, the, the links between Lorcan and Azura, they're, they're strong, but it's never that kind of um, idea is never really brought up by the Dunma. Yeah. Um, I don't want to get this wrong, but I'm, I'm fairly sure with the Khajiit, you know, Azura is obviously the maternal figure to the Khajiit, but she also kind of consoled Lorcan when he was existing in the Great Darkness and he was bleeding from his heart and all of this. It was Azura who essentially helped him survive that and pulled the darkness out of his heart and all of all of that stuff so you could her importance to Lorcan mm. and I guess you could say to the good Daedra is clear there but you don't really hear it said much in Chimer and Dunma mythology yeah but then Azura gets talked about a lot I would say even Azura in in the Dunma mythology it almost seems like she's the most talked about I think because mm. she has to do with like you know the prophecies and stuff like that but um yeah she's she's talked about a lot by comparison Mephila is by far the least I think but um, yeah, back to Boethia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to it's well, hard to take to, Boethia to, out of the tribunal. Like, oh, sorry, the good Daedra. Yeah, to be fair, like Boethia's, and, and this goes with a lot of characters in the Elder Scrolls. They're interesting because of their connections and interactions with other things. Like, you can't really, if you're just just discussing Boethia inside of inside a vacuum, it's yeah, you know, god of overcoming and and spirit of trials and like you know what i mean like it's not um there's not much to her outside of that it's what she does and how she interacts with the other things that 
You know, just thinking about it, it uh, once again, I'm going back to Azura, but I feel like the um, the the canon Nerevarine should be a Khajiit. It really, yeah. it really should. If you look at it through the um, the elsewhere mythology, because you you know, as as I was saying, you got Azura kind of pulling the darkness out of Lorcan's heart, and obviously the Khajiit are her people. So maybe a Khajiit needs to come along and kind of purify the heart of Lorcan from uh, Dagoth Ur's influence and the mm. the tribunal and all that. But that's just a I mean, random bit it, of it, yeah. I mean, it kind of makes more sense than a lot of the other races being mm. the Nerevarine. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. But Boethia. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I just have the exact Azura quote for you. Well, not not ex- <laughs> not exact quote, but just like reading. Um, Azura was able to rip the dark heart and all the darkness out of her brother before it... Oh, I literally just like clicked <laughs> page. Before it consumed him. And it's gone. Yeah. Um, and we d- as for her artifacts... Mm. I'm on the Azura page. I'm not, I was, I was kind of looking, wait, what Azura Star? That's not Boethia's artifact. Well, we, we we sort of mentioned the Ebony Mail, but we know what that is. It's a big, you know, Ebony suit of armor, and you know, it's had varying effects in different games. It's got the cool shadowy thing in Skyrim, but before it's been like um, fire resistance and stuff like that. But um, it's a big Ebony suit. If you call it the Death Shroud of of Lorcan, we, we explained that already. Um, another the, the other big one you know about is Goldbrand, which is the Golden Katana. Um, that's been around and apparently it was wielded by the Emperor when he charged into the Battle of the Red Ring. But then we learned that that was actually the forgotten hero that was wearing the Emperor's armor. That was meant to be uh, forged by the Dragons of the North, uh, assuming at Mora, Mm. which I think is really cool because it's an example of one of those artifacts that's not necessarily Daedric in origin, but then a Daedric prince decides to claim them. Mm. I think that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's def it's definitely um law. Then I wouldn't you know dragons of the north. You would assume at Mora, or perhaps even it could be Skyrim, I guess, in ancient times. But the reality of it is that it's Daggerfall era law. That's um it's the same as the whole like um Lyricia story, mm. um, where it's like fighting a, a that is a that or, is a narrative, but like yeah, you, you never you never know. And fear struck was never really mentioned again. There's replicas of the fear struck shield in the Elder Scrolls Online, but I mean that's just a replica. It's like a decorative kind of thing. Do you want me to quickly tell that story or the like? You can one? can in a second. Just real quick on the fear struck thing. Yeah. Um, I can't remember if this. I don't know when this uh, outfit style was put into ESO, and obviously that's how you can like get the shield look. But I don't know if it, how it worked. I don't know if the modder took inspiration from ESO and made the shield or mm. if it was the reverse and some something tells me in my head <clears> I feel like it's the reverse because there's this really cool mod um, I think it's even by Frankly HD the same guy that does all the textures and so on a, a bunch of the really four, good 4k textures he did a gold brand and fear struck and like a Boethia pack of Daedric items at one point I mean, pretty sure that, that would be cool if it was true I just Fra- I just don't know if if they would blatantly rip off a mod or for like that but I mean, it's not exactly the same, but I wouldn't the whole... put it past. I wouldn't put it past them at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of curious. Go on with the story. Well, I'm just going to look the, up the Lyrissius story. is is a Akavir story actually. So it's like a guy in ancient times, a hero Lyrissius fighting against Akaviri slave traders, and then he basically meets a, a worm or, or a dragon, um, and he has this shield, fear struck, given to him by Boethia. And the dragon melts the shield instantly, just breathes fire and fear struck's gone. And so he basically surrenders to the dragon, but very Boethia of him, he tricks the dragon by saying, oh, I'll uh, polish your one tarnished scale. There's this one scale the dragon can't reach. And so the dragon having an ego says, okay, fine. And then Lyrissius climbs on, shoves a dagger under the scale and the dragon can't hit him, which I find strange if it's just one untarnished, uh, one tarnished scale because he's obviously bigger than a scale. He's the size of a human, so the dragon should be able to hit him. But anyway, we'll ignore that part of the story. And then he basically forces the dragon to fly over and basically burn to a crisp the whole enemy army there and then jumps off knowing that he's going to die and then Boethia appears and saves him. Whip. There's your paraphrased <laughs> story. I mean, theoretically, though, a dragon would have a lot of trouble scratching any scale on its back, right? 
with its yeah. like, anatomy and its claws. But the way the story goes is like, there's this one scale. It can polish all the other ones, but it's like this mm. one spot on your back you can't itch. So it's like assuming Lyrisius is bigger than that one spot and that they can polish all the other ones doesn't really make sense. Yeah, it's, it's very thinking, The Hobbit. Yeah, I'm thinking too yeah. far into it, but I don't get how it would even happen. I'm going to put it out there. Um, I have a feeling that it was... It, like, it's not the exact same, but it's very similar in design with the, the golden steel for the fear struck thing. But um, if from, there's a Bro Jewel video from 2015 showing off the mod. So, like, if but you when consider, was it added to Elder Scrolls Online? But it's... I don't can't find exactly, but I know the... Um, because the book, the it's like one of those like online store sort of like replica like cosmetic kind of things. So I have a feeling it was actually after because Elder Scrolls Online only came out in twenty fourteen at that point. So it's I feel like it could have easily come in the many years since then um, afterwards. But it's it's similar enough. Like it's it's cool, but it's just yeah. I can probably I can probably find where a- it anyway. Came what out. it came out July twenty fifteen that I can see it. Added. The fear struck. Yeah, but I don't know if this is the exact one because it says endorsements to total views six hundred. So I don't, don't think that's. So it is really similar. Hold on. But yeah, I mean, we don't want to kick off some lawsuit. We're just <laughs> we're just looking at the law. <laughs> yeah, because there's the Skyrim special edition pages, obviously on like mod pages, but then you can actually, if you look it up, just go to the normal Skyrim. One. I don't know, but yeah, could be. Anyway, what, the point was, it'd be really cool if it actually was, because it's kind of, I loved whenever you see that kind of like outer law stuff get canonized in game. It's cool. Like how they canonized the the uh, depiction of Alicia, the statue with the hood, the mm. horns and everything and so on. Like they, they, they do look at the fan stuff and take inspiration from it. So it's definitely cool. Mm. But um, I can't believe Elder Scrolls Online came out in 2014. I thought it was I earlier remember, than that. I remember playing that at the very start when it came out, and it it was it was very messy back then. Oh yeah, I remember being. Yeah, in, they've done a lot to it. I remember then. being in high school in like the last year of high school in 2013, and like the E3 trailer and stuff for it had just come out, and looking at it and so <laughs> on, and yeah, and back in the, oh that's I gotta go. You know, Shoddy Cast. That's how they started off. Remember, it was like uh, podcasts in anticipation of Elder Scrolls Online. Was it? El- like Elder Scrolls Online it. kicked off a Cam- Camel, Camel as well. Camel started yeah. that. He had like guides for like how to get certain resources and stuff. I think I remember stuff mm. like that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. We, History st- list. we started a, a year before that in 2013. Yeah. April as well. Crazy. Fudge Muppets older than ESO. (laughs) We're older than a game. Yeah. (laughs) God, we're old. I know. We're so old. (laughs) We're we're gonna be Elder Scrolls boomers soon. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Like, well, dude, that already happens. Like the Morrowind boomers and stuff. I feel like. I don't know. I feel like Daggerfall Arena is like proper boomer, right? Yeah. Proper boomer is playing Daggerfall. Yeah, and like that level. What would you like? Gen X Morrowind. Our old mate Zarek is the is the ultimate Elder Scrolls boomer. Yeah, we, <laughs> we've got a little while to go before we get there. Yeah, yeah. It's weird when it's it will grow up one day and Skyrim will be the Elder Scrolls boomer game. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, it's crazy. I love accelerating the use of that word. Yeah, <laughs> like, now they've got to bring. It's too catchy t- to turns actually. Turns thirty, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, uh, what other artifacts are there? I don't really think there are any. There's those three. Uh, we can talk a little bit about Boethia's Realm, which has two names similar to how Death Shroud has a cool version. There's Snake Mount, which sounds cooler, but it could be better. And then there's Attributions Share. Um, which is the other name for the realm. Now, this realm of Boethia is kind of similar to the Deadlands. Like, it looks like Oblivion a bit. Well, when I say looks like Oblivion, looks like what you go through in an Oblivion gate in the game Oblivion. Um, Mm. Consists of stormy skies, volcanic islands, and lava seas. Now, I originally put this down to a game development thing, how in Oblivion, they obviously didn't go and make all these different Daedric realms. So that's why the Tournament of the Ten Bloods, which is Boethia's tournament where she has ten warriors fight against each other for an ultimate winner, 
um, looked how it looked. But then, I believe in the Elder Scrolls Online, you go to the Champions Arena, and that looks different, for sure, but it is a lava, kind of volcanic, fiery stone realm. Yeah, I, I think for me, the, the problem there is obviously, as you said, um, the reason it initially manifested like that is because they just wanted to use a cell of the Deadlands with Boethia's statue in it. Yeah. And ESO kind of like decided not to go too far against that. But I, I actually feel like there, there would be a good way that you could reconcile this law that was based around a limitation and not have it just be the Deadlands. And in that it's like, you know, if the idea is that Boethia's realm is just like a, a place for a, tour, a battle royale or a tournament or something like that um, then he can kind of adjust it to you know you can make the arena look like whatever you want like using a field spell in Yu-Gi-Oh or something like that um, <laughs> and just like change it up mm. um, rather than having it just be another place with lava oceans and stuff like that well interesting I oh what were you going to say I was just going to say the reason I believe it more to be like a cell thing is they did the same thing with Periart's Realm. It kind of yeah. just looks like the Deadlands. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Actually, are you sure that was Periart's Realm? I just looked it up, yeah. No, uh, hold on. I'm, I'm going to contest I'm gonna this. Was Periart just... I'm going to contest this. I'm going to contest it. Hold on. Was it, it just because it was Periart's quest? I don't know. It's called Oblivion to... Realm of Periart is like the location okay. name. So yeah, yeah. But it's... the actual dialogue that says... Yeah, okay, so here's the dialogue. So there's these followers, they get stuck in a stasis, and Periite basically goes, My followers are trapped between worlds, their bodies here on this plane, their souls in oblivion. I would have you reunite the bodies and the souls. I will transport mm. you to the plane of oblivion in which they are trapped. Find their souls when all are collected, I will return you here. So for, mm. for me, when I read that, I will transport you to the plane of oblivion in which they are trapped. He's not, like, if it was his realm, yeah. he'd be like, they're trapped in my realm. So, for me, I know it's called, like, Periat's realm, whatever, if it's called that in the game files. But I could definitely see a Periat realm being completely different, and that's not oh, for sure. anything Scott, to do with the lore. Scott, Michael's got you there. He's essentially, <laughs> oh, he's essentially <laughs> eaten you and shat you out. <laughs> you are Trinamac turn Malakab <laughs> after that one. <laughs> no, it's because I had the same, I had the exact same confusion. I don't remember yeah. what video I was mm, making, but when I heard that quote, I was like, oh, that, that sounds different to how I'd imagine and it if it was Periot's Realm. That's just mm. good news anyway. Let's not have Periot's Realm just be another yeah. ocean mm. of lava. I, I, I just saw like put it down the game things. Like even yeah. if it was supposed yeah. to be, it's just like I would just ignore it and expect them to do something cool in the future with it. Like, yeah, you know. Yeah. There is a, a, a scion, uh, like a demi-prince scion of Boethia. Um, Not a fun new far ten, new ten which oh, was meant Scion? is it si oh, Scion? Sc yeah. Sc oh, Scion. Scion. No, However, it's pronounced. I'm pretty sure it's Scion. We all know what I'm well, talking about. Let's, let's find out who's been trinamacked in this one. <laughs> 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 let's uh, have a listen. Scion. Scion. Shit. All right, boys, I'm retiring. <laughs> You're out. Hope you like going in the toilet. <laughs> flushed. BTFO. All right. Um. So, the Far Nuit Hen character was rules over a pocket realm called the Mal like Maelstrom, which um, the whole story can get a bit complicated, but it sounds like what you were talking about, Drew, when you were saying that like it could be like Yu-Gi-Oh! where you change the scenery. Mm -hmm. There were these, I think there were barons, and it, it's similar to the creation story. These barons kind of turned themselves into different, like, arenas which you can go and fight in um because it features in the elder scrolls online but i don't think it is just elder scrolls online lore because this far knew it hen if um, you get, character uh, was mentioned in the first sermon of the 36 yeah, lessons so you, of vivek so if you go um it's in that yeah these are called the barons of move like this then an eight yeah. Eighth Daedroth came, and he was a demi prince called Farnuet Hen, or the multiplier of motions unknown. Yeah. Of of sorry, motions known. And he said, "Whom do you wait for?" Yada yada. And it's, yeah. This is like the birth stuff. But but, but um, it is a very interesting demi prince in the sense that he knows like all martial arts basically, like that mm. could that could ever exist, and he continuously learns from his barons as they discover new martial styles during their adventures outside the realm. Um. However, he has a very weak memory and the barons, the, their lessons begin to fade if they're away from him. 
But then what happens is um, the barons put, it, it's like create the creation process. The barons put much of themselves into the creation process, basing each one on the lessons they learned while adventuring. Four of the arenas would be themed after a Daedric Prince's realm. The Baron who moves like a shivering droplet served Sheogorath. And like, they all have their different, like, kind of themes. Like the Baron who moves like a dancer's hips. It almost reminds me of um, Redguard Pantheon kind of stuff in the way that it's described. Um, anyway, so yeah, they have all the different places like Veil of the Surreal, Drome of Toxic Shock, Set's Flywheel, Rink of Frozen Blood. Um, so you can get a bit more interesting lore out of Boethia stuff there. Although there's not like a whole heap of interaction with Boethia and that specific um, mm. quest Cause I know stuff. This guy, because the guy appears in Elder Scrolls Online and I feel like this is the only time we've actually seen like a yeah. Demi Prince Prince for real. Because Demi Princes are a thing and it's just funny you don't really see them much. But I mean, I'm just looking at the wiki page for it now. There's like a Demi Prince of pastries regard like connected to <laughs> Sheogorath. Um, and there's some daughter of her scene, but there's also the other thing that makes me think of if it's just child and Mara like, House, right? But I mean, he's not like a demi Daedric prince. Sorry, sense, yeah, like, but they so, don't they like, call him? He's said to be the demi prince of all. Wins. That's out of. I'm pretty sure that's, that's Kirkbride stuff, actually. Yeah, uh, demi demi god is better. But the um, but uh, he's a. Uh, what was I gonna say? Um, oh yeah, there's also because I know Malakath had a son at one point. The one that Sheogorath tricked him into killing or i can't remember exactly how it went down but malakath's son died so i guess he would be a demi prince but um yeah we've drifted a little far from boethia <laughs> not not really but, i mean the this is a sign of boethia like a yeah but i feel that's about it right? yeah but it's related and the the the, the yeah. themes of combat and all that they all shine through so yeah seems to make sense well any of you boys got anything else to say about this Daedric Prince Boethia? The very last thing I, well, I could talk about is, um, you know, there's, there's a picture that on the on the wiki there, um, but the the, day, the the face of the inspiring fountain, a Dunma mask aspect of Boethia. And I really, there's cool concept art around for this too, but the multiple Daedric helmets now supposed to be like representative of gods. Like I really like the idea of Daedric armor like fashioned in a sort of representative way of a mm -hmm. Daedric prince, like different things, but, um, and it had, f it has floating horns and that's cool too, but yeah, that's so, I, I love that. I didn't even notice that now that I'm like actually looking at it and seeing the horns are hovering above mm. the mask. That is like, I'm actually like, else. I, I, I quite like, uh, Daedric armor. Um, in Morrowind in as well. Yeah, in Morrowind. Um, I like Skyrim's. I know what they're going for, the harsher sort of thing, but I still like the glowing red stuff more. I think, even though Nostalgia, I still. Oblivion's is probably my least favorite of them all, but I still really like it just because Nostalgia was like so cool to get and so on. But I like the ones that look a little having bit... the demonic face helps because it's like yeah. Skyrim's Daedric armor isn't really scary. It's yeah. just, you know, it's cool, but it's not scary. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like scary faces and masks and stuff. And I feel like that should be for demon armor, which is quite literally what it is. You know, mm. so. Well, if anyone out there listening is in a super Boethia mood, we did recently-ish make, <laughs> as in like October 2020, make a Boethra build, the Golden Lion, which you can go and play and it uses mods and has gold brand. So you can have fun with that. Yeah. Yeah, I think any any last words? Nope. No. Uh, no. Uh, thrust <laughs> spear. <laughs> I thrust my spear through Drew <laughs> before Boethia kills me. All right. Well, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we'll be back to nerd out with you again next time. All right.